This time, I'm going to ask them to bring their 10 minutes of concluding and closing remarks. So we're going to invite Dr. White to present his 10 minutes, please. Thank you. Once again, allow me to thank all of you for the honor of your being here this evening. Uh, I do think that it says a lot that there are so many of us who want to engage these issues and to do so in an attitude of mutual respect, but not an attitude of compromise about what we believe. Uh, I'm afraid that this happens far too rarely in our society, and I think we have demonstrated yet once again that this can be done in a way that is proper and honoring to the truth. Uh, I would like to uh, once again uh, thank Abdullah, and uh, I knew that uh, Abdullah at least is one of the few people I've debated who actually took the time to read something I had written, and I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that he would have this copy, but he doesn't have a signed one. <laughs> I do very much appreciate that. I've debated so many people. Uh, I, I, when, when I debated an atheist last year in the United States, he hadn't even Googled my name, let alone had any concern whatsoever <laughs> as to what I would have to say. And so it is uh, an honor to have someone actually take some time to uh, try to understand what it is I'm saying. I hope that those of you who have seen some of the debates I've done in the past with Shabir Ali and Zalbakar Ali Shah and some others uh, recognize that I do take this very seriously because I love the Muslim people. And I hope you recognize that when I take the time to be listening, as I did for over a year, to everything Shabir Ali had ever said on MP3, every lecture he'd ever given, even ones on Hadith studies to Muslims, so that I could understand what he was saying, I did that so that I could have the best debate with him that I could where we would have the clearest communication. Because I truly believe that these opportunities, when we still have the freedom to do it, are vitally important and they're precious and we need to take advantage of them. There are a lot of nations on earth where we could not do what we've done this evening. And we need to be thankful for the freedoms that we have. Now very, very quickly, I want to just address a couple of things that Abdullah said. He said that, uh, we, that I had seemingly indicated, he heard me say, that we have to accept it blindly in regards to the text of the Testament because it's the best. I never said that. If I believed in accepting the New Testament blindly, I wouldn't have given them a critical edition of the Greek New Testament. I wouldn't be studying textual critical issues. I wouldn't have, when I went to Australia this past summer and uh, debated a, a fine young man, Abdullah Kunda, there at the University of Sydney, uh, I would not have taken the one free day I had in Sydney instead of going and seeing sightseeing. I went and saw manuscript P91 at McCory University. I'm a freak. That's just the way it is. <laughs> I take these things very, very seriously. I'm not talking about accepting the New Testament blindly. I am differentiating between a methodology that picks and chooses which text in the New Testament you're going to give way to without even looking at what the textual evidence is. And the, the attitude that comes from that that allows you to quote this but you know, dismiss that, I am contrasting that with my position that accepts what the New Testament says, not uncritically, I mean, I've written an entire book that's used as a textbook in the United States as an introduction to textual critical studies. I don't do it uncritically. But I do accept everything that God has given, and we can know what God has given to us. The original readings have not passed away. They are still there. And so when we take all of that, what Abdullah calls ambiguous texts are not ambiguous <laughs> at all. I've only given you a couple of them. But just think about what happens in John 8, the I Am text. When Jesus says to the soldiers, I am, they fall back upon the ground. Why do soldiers fall back upon the ground when you say, I am? Isn't it clear what's going on there in John 13, 19? Jesus quotes from Isaiah 43, 10, from which Jehovah's Witnesses get their name, ironically, a text about Yahweh, and he applies it to himself. The writer of Hebrews identifies Jesus as Yahweh. At the end of the Gospel of John, what does Thomas say to Jesus? My Lord and my God. And Jesus does not rebuke him. I am but a Rasul. He says, because you've seen me, you believe, Thomas. Blessed are those who did not see and yet have believed. These are not ambiguous texts. They are clear texts. I simply allow all the texts to stand. So when, when the young man asks Jesus, 
and calls him good master. Now Luke has a different rendering of that. That's an interesting synoptic issue, but it doesn't change the fact that Jesus wants this young man to know who he is dealing with. It's not a contradiction. If there's such a clear way of understanding it, why would we allow that to stand? Would you treat the Quran that way? How do you like it when people come to the text of the Quran and, well, I'm not going to believe what's in, uh, in, in Surah 2, but I'm going to take a few texts from Surah 4, and, and I don't like Surah 7, but I like Surah 19. No, you have to take it for all it says. And it's in fact in that context that I want to, again, direct your attention. Now, now uh, Abdullah made some comments about this, but listen to these words in Surah Al-Anam, Surah 6, 101. He is the originator of the heavens and the earth. How can he have a son when he has had no mate, consort, wife? I took the time to look at uh, Ibn Kathir and others to make sure I was not misinterpreting this. And they all say the same thing. It, it's so clear Allah cannot have a son because he could not have a spouse that would be equal to him. What does that tell us the Quran is saying in Surah 5, in Surah 6? It's presenting the idea that the Trinity is Allah and Mary giving birth to Jesus. I don't think Surah 2, 253 even comes close to actually being a, a, a discussion of the Christian doctrine of the Trinity in its context. And I would wonder, I would, I would challenge Abdullah, if he has this information, could he tell us if the early interpreters, al be Ibn Kathir, did they interpret that one? Did they see that? Is that text meaning that? I'd be interested in knowing. Because I haven't looked at Surah 2, 2, 2, 3, 3 in their commentary, and I will. I'll put it on the list of things that need to be studied. And I'll take a look at it. But I have a feeling that's not what they're going to say. But I know what they say, because they did take the time to look at this text. And they understand this as being, Allah cannot have a son because he cannot have a wife. Well, that's not what we believe. And the Athanasian Creed doesn't say God has a wife. Before it ever talks about begettal, it makes it something that is outside of time. It's not something where God takes a wife and has a kid. Now I'm appreciative of the fact that Abdullah at least tries to argue against the Trinity in a little more meaningful fashion. But let's face it, folks. I've listened to everything that Ahmed Didat said, too. And man, that's bad argumentation against the Trinity. That's exactly, I mean, how many times did Ahmed Didat say that? say that the, this belief that Jesus is the Son of God attributes sexuality to God. He understood it the same way that Ibn Kathir understood uh, uh, the, the, the 6101. How many Muslims understand, misunderstand it that way? But the real question is, isn't that what the Quran says? Isn't that why they misunderstand it? If this is an uncreated text, written in eternity, then wouldn't it be absolutely true in everything it says, including how it represents the faith that it then condemns the followers of to the eternal flames? There's very few things more important than that. And so once again this evening, my exhortation to all of us, Christian and Muslim alike, is we have to think about what we believe and why we believe it. What God are we going to worship? Has God revealed himself as being unitary? We all agree, monotheism. But has he revealed himself to be Unitarian? Can you take the words that Jesus says and put them in the mouth of a mere Razul? Does a mere Razul, did Moses, Abraham, David, any of these ever say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me? Not by my teachings, but by me, personally. Did any mere Razul say, if any of you are weary, come unto me, all you who are weary, heavy laden, I will give you rest. Did any mere Razul say, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins? My friends, you don't want to die in your sins. That sounds awful fine to me. And those Jews who stood in front of Jesus when he said those words, they would have accepted him as a Messiah. He fed 5,000 people. Miraculously, they would have accepted him as a Messiah. They would have accepted him as a prophet. But what they could not accept him as was what he revealed himself to be, the very eternal Son of God, that Thomas, when he sees the resurrected Lord, bows in humble adoration and says, My Lord and my God. And that's what I do today. 
And that's the Jesus I proclaim and present to you this evening. Thank you. his concluding and closing remarks. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to thank everyone for coming today and seeing this kind of debate. This moment, my last statement, so I just wanted to thank you for uh, going to questions and answers. I just mention a few points. I want to mention about the issue of the Quran first before anything else. Because I mentioned that the Quran stands the Trinity, and I didn't have enough time to fully go through all the verses, and I've got like uh, 15 verses here with uh, Tafsir. But um, I have a copy of the Tafsir uh, here of Ibn Kathir, uh, Fakhruddin al Razi, and uh, Kurtubi. They all say, uh, they all say, apart from one of them, that the verse uh, does not necessarily mean that it is Mary who is the... It doesn't actually indicate that Mary is the uh, third person of the Trinity. In fact, it indicates more that uh, she was taken later on, after Jesus, as uh, an intercessor beside God, and hence the Christians were told to, to idolize uh, of this uh, Mary, even though it doesn't necessarily mean that you literally worship, because none of us the Quran says when the, the polytheists say, oh, we're not, uh, we don't worship these other idols, we just use them as intercessors, and the Quran rebukes them for committing shirk, which is associating parts of God. It doesn't matter uh, what you claim you're doing it for, what you are doing is taking other gods, and again, James White used the same polemic against Catholics. But maybe in his defense, he might say, but Catholics are not Christian. Hence, the Quran is wrong when it should be the Christians. Perhaps. Uh, I have to go with that one. But anyway, uh, the, the, the Quran verse, uh, so Surah 6, verse 101, which says, you know, wonderful origin of the heavens and earth, how can he have a son when he has no consort? According to Tafsir, it's actually referring to a, a polemic against certain pagans who say that God has uh, sons. Because also the pagan Arabs also said that God's have, God has sons and daughters. <coughs> Uh, the Tafsir says to this, but I can also say that it also applies to the Trinity because why the use of masculine reproductive titles for an eternal configuration of God? God's internal configuration is based on the relationship of masculine reproductive human titles. Why is that? Makes no sense. So that's what the Quran is, is pointing out here. I like to think, according to, and I have some Tafsir uh, to, to back that up. Um, verse uh, 9. Sort of 30, sorry, sort of 9 verse uh, 31 does say that the, uh, again, the, the Christians and Jews took their priests and Anchorites as laws besides God, not by worshipping them, but by obeying them blindly without question. So, do I have one? 10 minutes, is it? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. Now, I've mentioned a few points about what James White said. He says that we don't take we don't take the New Testament blindly, you know, I'm very critical, I look at different, you know, Greek variations and, and supposedly if a newer manuscript, or an older, should we say an older manuscript came to light, he would take that over the current manuscripts available. And that's fine, but he's missed my point entirely. Because see, I'm not saying that he doesn't look at the, the critical, critically the text and different variations. I'm saying, why is there variations? Variations based on which have <coughs> theological implications. And in the, in the presence of the Christian belief that the Holy Spirit will preserve the texts, you have Christians believing false doctrines where the Trinity itself is, the word Trinity is put into the text for hundreds of years. Why is this? Why is not the Trinity preventing such doctrines from being inserted into the Bible? That's my point. The text is not being, is not divinely protected. That's my point. And if the text is not divinely protected, then we have to question the text itself. He said that we, would, uh, that we pick and choose uh, the text in the Bible. I said, no, I didn't say, I didn't say that there is no text which back him up. I said that I'll leave it to him to bring up some text that back his, his position up that uh, Jesus is God. All I'm doing, and all, I, all Muslim politicians are doing, we're just highlighting the contradictions in your text. That's all. 
We're not saying that there's no text that can be implied through using the Islamic hermeneutics that Jesus is God. No, we're saying that there's contradictions in your text. And if you read the New Testament, not based on from a Quranic perspective, um, uh, read the New Testament from an Old Testament hermeneutics, Old Testament idiom. Why is God confusing us by in the Old Testament saying that uh, you know, so many of his chosen ones are the Son of God, and in the New Testament Jesus is called a chosen one as well. So why is God confusing us by using a term which has been used previously for all, all bunch of human prophets, or human uh, uh, and so on, or angels, and then uh, saying, oh no, but this Son of God is, is actually uh, even more special than the other created sons of God that I have. This causes confusion in the mind of uh, a Jew listening to this. He, believes we, he says he is tota scriptura. Tota of what? You know, take the total scripture. Total scripture of what? What, the, everything that's in the Protestant Bible currently. Who selected that Bible for you? Why not Gospel of Thomas? Or why not uh, a very, a, a gospel, a various other Gospels which are, which are, are present and so on? I was going to mention Gospel of Basilides, which is contemporary to the Gospel of John, for example. Gnostic text, true, but contempor about contemporary to the Gospel of John. And so why not take that text? Obviously we don't have it, but why did the church fathers not preserve this and so on? Why? Because they, they picked it, they chose it. And so on. It's as simple as this. So you're, you're, you're taking to I'm total scriptura of a text that was picked because the Bible didn't come with a contents page. That, that's, that's the truth. He said that Justin Martyr doesn't quote Paul. That's very interesting. An esteemed early church father not quoting Paul. I think that actually argues against him. That Paul's text was not the seminal theological text that informed all the church fathers' thinking. Because uh, at that time, there was no such thing as a New Testament. So where did they get their doctrines from? Where did they get it from? Yeah, they, they picked and chose doctrines they thought was most likely because there was no text. They just heard it. And so the, these early church fathers have various different opinions of each other. He said, we wouldn't like it if, uh, if uh, a Christian picked and chose text from the Quran. No, go ahead. If you can show a contradiction, then we will leave our faith. It's as simple as that. Because we have a condition, as the Quran says, if it's order from God, you will find many contradictions. So bring a contradiction, and we won't try to, we won't say, oh, uh, well, you're picking and choosing. No, we will say, fine, you just proven the Quran. We won't say, ah, but we've got a lot of verses, something else. No, we will uh, we'll be more sincere, we'll be sincere about this. Now, um, I think I answered most of the points that he mentioned and so on. So I just wanted to mention a few things that you might not, uh, you might not know. Very interesting uh, fact about uh, Justin spoke of uh, Justin Martyr spoke of the Logos as a second god. Oregon church, church father, he said we are not afraid of it uh, in one sense to speak of, of two gods, and in another sense one god, referring to Jesus and the Father. Again, he said uh, we should not pray to any general being, not even to Christ, only to God and the Father of the universe. Oregon early church father, uh, I think he's quoting in, in his own book as well. Uh, Creed of Serdica, that the three have one identical hypostasis. The three, uh, the three hypostasis have one identical hypostasis. You're just contradicting yourself. And of course, you know, Anthanasius said that, uh, declared uh, that uh, God's, uh, the Logos is God's offspring, and so on. So, all the Quran, everything the Quran has mentioned about offspring, about God being a son, is accurate. And, I would, and if I had more time, I would show you where the Quran even uh, says, that uh, if God wants to have a son, he could choose anything in creation, showing that the Quran understands the Old Testament concept where having a son is meant to be means to choose someone to be a special uh, prophet or a, a, a blessed person. Now, to conclude, I don't think he's onto any of the rational arguments against the Trinity. I think that the, the church fathers who weren't afraid of trying to use philosophy, I've demonstrated that, that the philosophies have failed to redress contradictory interpretations in the New Testament, which at one point the pictures as God, and at another point uh, the pictures as not God. Uh, whether you take it as ambiguous or explicit text, you can, you can uh, uh, judge it on it for yourself. But I will say this, I, as a former Christian who embraced Islam after much research and investigation into, into different religions, beliefs and, and lack of beliefs, um, on becoming a Muslim, I didn't give up my belief in Jesus. Rather, I discovered the real Jesus. All the ambiguities and the contradictions vanished about this Jesus. I finally understood his mission, I understood his aims, his true personality, the true glory of Jesus. And the noble, truthful, steadfast, wise and loving person. And all this from a man. From a mere man. And he had all these characteristics, and he's a mere man. That's even more, uh, I, I think, a better praise. If he was God, oh, of course, God is perfect. But a man to have those qualities, now that is something to appreciate.
To this end, I would like to begin, I would like to, uh, to end, uh, I the beginning of the end, rather, uh, my, my uh, summation with a testimony of faith that there is only one God of whom the Christians and Jews call the Father, and there is one Messiah, Jesus, Son of Mary, the servant and messenger of God, a created human being, created in the manner all human beings are created, and possessing every limited attribute a human being possesses, both in knowledge and spirit. And, I, and as the sword of the Quran 3 and verse 64 says, O people of Scripture, come to a common word between us that we shall worship none but God, and that we shall ascribe no parts unto him, and none of us shall take others for lords beside God. Thank you. And, and lastly, in acknowledgement of, uh, of James White's uh, generosity, I'd like to give him something. The Islamic book of a doctrine called A Guide to Conclusive Proofs of Principles of Belief. I'm sorry, it got, it got kind of murder on the bag in the way here on the front. <laughs> but by Imam Haramayn Juwaini, and it discusses holistically Islamic theology, including uh, refutation of the Trinity and the Incarnation. So, for you. <laughs> This brings an end to our formal debate. We now have some questions from the floor. As I said, these are only a sampling and we'll try to evenly distribute them. The format for the questions will be to the person addressed, given one minute to respond, and there will be followed by that 30 seconds of response uh, from the other individual. So, as you can tell, the time is short. And gentlemen, please uh, keep to the mark if you could. First question is addressed to Abdullah. Question says, both faiths believe that God is eternal. He has no beginning and no end. How can that be? We do not know, but we believe it because God has revealed it. If God has revealed himself as Trinity in the Angel. Should not Muslims believe it since the prophet of Islam said that Muslims believe the Angel as it existed in the sixth century? Um, it, it doesn't say in the Quran that the, the present text that Christians have is the Injil, the book they use. Um, the Quran might, might ask Christians to look into their scriptures, but it also, in, in another word it uses for the teaching of Jesus is Injil. So we have the Christians with their scripture, and we have Jesus taught teaching the Injil, which are viewed in the Quran as two separate uh, entities. Um, the first point of that question is what he said, how do I know that God is eternal? I had to rely on revelation. Well, uh, no I didn't, because just as it says in Romans, uh, uh, what was it, 19 or so, I'll find that at some point. Um, we can know about God by looking at the signs of God's existence. And where is the signs of God's existence? It's all around us. It is the universe. And we can conclude that there exists a creator that was beyond the limitations of this universe. And this, this creator is unlimited. And because it's unlimited, then it's not limited in any way, shape, or form. That is the only thing we can deduce from this creator. Yes. Exodus 546 says, In their footsteps we sent Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming the law that had come before him. We sent him the gospel there, and his guidance and light and confirmation of the law that had come before him, the guidance and the knowledge of the law. law. Let the people of the gospel judge by what the law hath revealed therein, therein in the Injil. If it is not it has not been preserved, how can a law tell us to judge by what's in it if we no longer have it? Okay, thank you. This question is addressed to James White, and the question is, where is the term Yahweh applied to the sun? And then I think it says, uh, all and Jesus, I can't quite mark it out here, but it says, where is Yahweh applied to the sun? And Jesus are all on Jesus. I'm not sure what it's a okay. I would like to invite all of you this evening, if you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, to uh, turn to this 102nd Psalm, Psalm 102, 25 through 27, after tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, turn to Psalm 102, 25 through 27, and read there about the description of Yahweh as the eternal creator of all things who does not change. He is a human. 
Then turn to the first chapter of Hebrews, read through the chapter, and realize when you get to verse 10 that the writer is going to take those very words about the immutable, unchangeable creator of all things and apply them to the Son as his concluding evidence of the supremacy of Jesus to the angels. Uh, that's just one of a number of texts. You can also go to John chapter 6, verses 39 to 41, compare that with Isaiah chapter 6, and you'll discover that there are many places where the New Testament writers specifically identify Jesus as Yahweh. 36. Okay. Um, I think just, just, just very quickly, I want to be a bit more to respond to the previous one. Um, the Injili is contained in a kind of uh, dissolved form within the, the Christian scriptures. And the Quran, that's why I think in our discussions, we try to use critical thinking to elicit the real Injil out of the scriptures that the Christians possess. And I think this is what I think any Christian, especially Unitarian Christians who come to a rejection of the Trinity by themselves, will then occur the same. Uh, that they kind of realize it after much research and looking, they actually come to the same understanding. Right. Thank you. This question is for you, Abdullah. It says, you say there could be no, no three infinites in heaven, meaning God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. And the question is this, what about the Quran? Islam says there is one Quran in heaven and one on earth. Are these then two eternal Qurans? Sure. Um, in the Quran, it says that there is a preserved tablet. You can say it's an infinite tablet, or an unlimited tablet, or what have you. It is a tablet which records the words of God in heaven, and we have a book on earth which records the words of God on earth. None of these books or tablets are God in any way, shape, or form. They're just records, so uh, I don't know where the confusion would probably lie on that. Let's go, let's, let's get, get some more questions in. Okay. James, this one is for you. Uh, in Christianity, the Trinity designates that God has three separate entities, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if God is the Father and also the Son, would he then be the Father of himself because he is his own Son? <laughs> Plus the Holy Spirit, how does this feature into the concept? How is this possible? Please explain. Fundamental this uh, identification and this definition of the doctrine of the Trinity that was just uh, presented there. Uh, we are not saying that there are three entities that are one entity, or the Father is the, the Father of himself, or anything along those lines. Uh, Jesus said in John 17, 5, he's praying to the Father, he said, glorify me together with yourself, Father, with the glory which I shared with you before the world was. Now that is a person who knows that he is eternally existent, he knows that he shared the very glory of God. Isaiah tells us that God shares his glory with none. And that in the current situation, he has been humbled. He has entered into human flesh. And that in his prayer to the Father, he is seeking once again to return back to that place where he was with the Father. Very clearly, I simply ask my Muslim friends, could the Jesus that you say you believe in ever say the words Jesus said in John 17, 5? 30 seconds. Sure. Um, I think the confusion lies in uh, Augustine trying to reconcile some problems. Augustine, who wrote a book on the Trinity, I recommend all you read it. It's a fascinating read. Um, he's, he tried to reconcile the problem whereby you have uh, Jesus saying that uh, he, you know, he works with, with, with the Father and they have the same power and they do the same, uh, they do the same things. And at the same time, they're separate. So Augustine says, that what the Father does also you can say that the Son does, but they still don't do the same as each other, which is a contradiction. And I think that's where uh, we get the confusion from. Thank you. Abdullah, this question is for you. I think it's a reference to something that uh, James White said. Why were some Qurans burnt? Sure. I'm very uh, thankful that you brought that question. I didn't get time to uh, answer that. You know, uh, James White mentioned in one of his talks about New Testament liability. Um, he always brings up the Quran a lot for some reason. And in it he says that, well, you can't criticize the New Testament too harshly, you, you Muslims, because uh, we didn't have a state from the very beginning which could basically put state resources to preserve our book. And that's, that's, that's true. 
uh, Uthman encountered, it wasn't deal, didn't deal with the Quran, it didn't change anything of the Quran, and there's no record or any schism at all to say he changed the Quran. It was the written, uh, I guess, the, Ara- the, I guess the, the standardization of the Arabic language occurred, and the standardization of the writing, how words are spelled in using letters uh, of the Quran, and I would challenge anyone to say, uh, to bring evidence contrary to that. Uh, the reason I raised the Quran is because the Quran was transmitted in a very different way than the New Testament was. The New Testament was, was transmitted by the free distribution of manuscripts, whereas the Quran had a controlled distribution. And it is well known amongst scholars who study these fields that for a couple of hundred years, between Umayyad and Kaab, especially Ibn Masud, those specific readings of Ibn Masud's manuscript tradition remain in the Quranic manuscript uh, manuscripts themselves, especially Fogg's palimpsest manuscript. So the, the facts are there to look at. Thank you. Dr. White, this question is for you. If the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are equal, why then does the Son, that is Jesus, need to pray to the Father? And there's a verse quoted, in the verse he went further and fell on his face and prayed. When Jesus takes on a human nature, what kind of a man is he going to be? An atheist? <laughs> I'm serious. It's amazing when, when people when people ask this question, I simply ask that question. If, if he's the perfect man, what kind of a man is he going to be? Is he going to be a man of prayer? If, if he has had eternal communion with the Father, the Son and the Father, eternally together, John 1, 1 Philippians 2, Hebrews 1, if, if that communion has been perfect, then will not the God-man be a man of prayer just as Jesus was? When it says that they are equal, it doesn't mean they're the same person. And it doesn't mean they've taken the same roles in salvation. The Father did not become flesh. The Spirit did not become flesh. The Son did. And as the Son, He was the perfect man. That's one of the reasons the righteousness that is mine because of Him is a perfect righteousness. He loved God perfectly. Something I've never been able to do, and neither has anybody else out there. Um, just to say where well, Augustine mentions uh, that both, when both the Father and the Son do things, uh, they meant to be saying they do the same thing together, uh, it's in chapter 5, book 1. Anyway, um, in response to that, God coming down as a man, he'd still be God. So why, why need to, to worship? God is perfect, right? But he's all, and the jealousy is a moral imperfection. In the Old Testament, God is all jealous. So God doesn't need to subscribe to our moral standards. God doesn't need to worship to be perfect. He is perfect. Thank you. We're going to draw this to a close. These will be the final two questions. There are many, many more questions, and I know that uh, you have several of them. Simply for time's sake, uh, we will draw this to a close. I said we try to close as close to 10.30 as possible. We're going about 15 minutes beyond that. So let's uh, bring these two questions. This is for Abdullah. Abdullah, this question comes to you and says, why do you try to establish arguments by quoting the Bible when you believe the text is corrupt? Why not just say we know nothing about God before Muhammad spoke? Well, because very much as uh, James White mentioned, the, the verse of the Quran where a uh, Christian through critical thinking can establish the real angel uh, hidden in their scriptures, um, you believe it, and hence I'm talking to you, and I will quote texts which you believe to establish truisms. Because there is truth in the, in the, new, in the, well, the documentation known as the New Testament. There is, there is truth, I'm not saying there is no truth. So it's about finding that truth and making it plain to, uh, plain to you so you can come to uh, a concept of the real worship of God and the, the real nature of Jesus as being a human being and the Messiah. I, I believe it is one well, of the clearest examples of the anachronism that marks the Islamic Christian dialogue, that the Muslim looks back upon the text that preceded it only through the lens of the Quran and makes that final document the means by which he interprets what came before it. Whereas when Muhammad argues for his own prophethood in Surah 5, he argues the other direction. There seems to be a major difference between modern Islamic argumentation and the original argumentation you see in the Quran at that point, in my opinion. Thank you. Our final question, Dr. White, it says this, if the Trinity is so important, then why is it not explicit in the Old Testament? 
Well, because the Trinity is revealed between the Old Testament and the New Testament. How can it be explicit in the Old Testament if the very revelation of the Trinity takes place after the Old Testament had been in written form for 400 years? How is that possible? The revelation of the Trinity is in the incarnation of the Son and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The original apostles were experiential Trinitarians. Think of Peter. He stands upon the Mount of Transfiguration. He hears the Father speak. He walks with Jesus. He's now indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's an experiential Trinitarian. But you see, the revelation of the Trinity takes place between the Testaments. That's why the New Testament documents don't even, don't even define it in the way we'd like it to, because they're soaked in it. It's part of the very language. It's part of the very greetings. It's, it's taken as, a, as an understood thing, because the revelation has taken place in Jesus Christ. Uh, Abilah said, well, the Jews never expected that. Yeah, that was the whole point. That was the whole point that makes Jesus so amazing. I, I basically, just answer quickly, um, I think it's an assumption that the language of the New Testament is, is couched with a presupposition of Trinity and so on. I think that's been anachronistic looking back to the texts. If it was so well understood by the Trinity, then why need to formulate it over three three to four hundred years afterwards? Uh, you know, I, I just don't, you know, don't see that. I say that if the, believing the Trinity wasn't good enough uh, to in, in explicit form for the early apostles, then why do we need to believe it now? That's my question. Well, this throws our debate to an end. Let's give both of our. Uh...